Our scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9. Mark, chapter 9. A few weeks ago, we looked at verses 38 through 50, part 1. Now we will have part 2 today. Mark chapter 9, beginning in verse 38. Hear now the word of the living God. John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink, because you belong to Christ, will by no means lose his reward. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. May God bless the reading of his word to us this morning. We saw last time that Saul Alinsky, in his Rules for Radicals, wrote, for those who want to change the world from what it is to what they believe it should be. He gave a manual on how the powerless can seize power and thereby bring meaning to their lives. Alinsky even addresses the issue of ethics. He says that ethical standards must be elastic to stretch with the times. There is no universal standard of right and wrong, says Alinsky. He says life and how you live it is the story of means and ends. The end is what you want, and the means is how you get it. The man of action views the issues of means and ends in pragmatic and strategic terms. He has no other problem. He thinks only of his actual resources and the possibilities of various choices of actions. He asks of ends only whether they are achievable and worth the cost, of means only whether they will work. So he doesn't care if the ultimate goal is virtuous. He only cares if it is attainable and worth the price you have to pay to achieve it. And he doesn't care if an action is morally right. He only cares if it works. So murder could be a useful means if it works to achieve a worthwhile goal. That's Saul Alinsky's ethic. In our passage this morning, Jesus reveals a very different ethical standard. Last time we saw Jesus' teaching that life in his kingdom involves radical cooperation. Today we see that it involves a radical ethic. First, we see a radical ethic concerning others. Second, we see a radical ethic concerning ourselves. So just to recap where we are, we saw last time Jesus and his disciples are back in Capernaum in Galilee. They're inside a house, it says in verse 33 of chapter 9. So he's speaking here only to his disciples. He's not addressing the crowds. The disciples, we saw, tried to stop a man from casting out demons in Jesus' name. They were embarrassed because he was successful in casting out the demon, whereas they were not. We saw earlier in Mark chapter 9, verse 18. This man was a follower of Christ apart from the disciples. So they don't like that the man didn't try to go through them to get to Jesus. He tells them not to hinder this man because he is a supporter of Christ's kingdom. And so Jesus tells them in verse 
41, truly I say to you, whoever gives a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Then we come to verse 42. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Here we see the radical ethic concerning others. This is the inverse of verse 41. A small gesture, when done in the name of Christ, will receive a great reward. Just a cup of water, you will receive a reward from Christ. But a sinful deception... Verse 42, this will receive eternal punishment. Now the question is, does this verse close the section that begins in verse 38? So is the section 38 to 42, or is this verse the beginning of a new section, 42 to 50? It could go either way. There are parallels we see. Verse 41 says, whoever. Verse 42 also begins with whoever. So it seems as if those two verses are connected. On the other hand, we have verses 42 and 43 beginning with nearly the same construction. Whoever causes you to sin, verse 42. If your hand causes you to sin, verse 43. So those verses are also connected. So it seems to me that we should treat both of these paragraphs that the ESV has arranged separately. We should treat them as one unit. That's why we've had uh, two sermons on this one large passage. So all these verses are connected. But who are these little ones that Jesus refers to in verse 42? It could refer to someone small in stature. Speaking of Zacchaeus, Luke 19, he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature, same word. I'm not so sure that Jesus is issuing a stern warning about not harming short people, though. That seems rather specific. Of course, we shouldn't look down on short people even though they're often overlooked. I'll spare you any more short jokes. Oh, ye of little faith doesn't refer to short people. So he's probably not talking of short people here in verse 42. Some believe it refers to children. This word can refer to children. In a parallel passage in Matthew 18, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, but whoever causes one of these little ones, same word, who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck to be drowned in the depth of the sea. So he could be referring to children here in Mark chapter 9. It seems to me, though, better to understand this as referring to those who are small in power and influence. They're insignificant. They're unimportant. Citizens of the kingdom are the least of these. Matthew 11. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has risen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So I think he's speaking here of Christians in general in verse 42. The least regarded in society. The little ones. The little ones who believe in Christ. Now the word rendered... To sin is from the word, is the word from which we get the word scandal in English. It includes the idea of causing someone to commit sin, but also leading someone astray into false teaching, into unbelief. You see the footnote in the ESV, to stumble can be a rendering of this word. So Jesus here is delivering a harsh warning against those who would lead Christians into committing sin, as well as leading them away from the faith into apostasy. And he says it'd be better for them to have a great millstone hung around their neck and thrown into the sea. Drowning was sometimes used as a means of execution in the ancient world. Josephus writes of a revolt by the Galileans against the party of Herod in the first century B.C., in which the Galileans drowned Herod's men in a lake as part of their execution. Caesar Augustus, emperor, was merciful to a man who was guilty of killing his own father. He spared him from the required punishment of being sewn into a sack and drowned. Sometimes the Romans were so cruel, they would even include wild animals in the sack along with the one being executed sewing them up 
casting them into the sea, a very cruel form of punishment. So drowning is a form of execution in the ancient world. A millstone, Jesus references here, this was used to crush grain. In the first century, rotary mills were the common form of crushing grain. Typically, a mill would have an upper stone and a lower stone. The upper stone would revolve on top of the lower stone, crushing the grain. The upper stone could sometimes weigh as much as 3,000 pounds. And that's probably what Jesus is referring to here. A stone that weighs 3,000 pounds hung around your neck. Now, we don't have any reports from the ancient world involving executions, including drowning with millstones attached. It's overkill. He's speaking hyperbolically. Jesus' point is that this brutal form of punishment is better than the eternal punishment that comes as judgment for leading Christians into sin. All the false teachers, from Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, to Bishop John Shelby Spong, the Protestant liberal we looked at a few weeks ago, to Joel Osteen, all of them will meet this fate. And drowning with a millstone around your neck would be preferable to the punishment that they will face on the last day. Leading people astray from the true faith receives the ultimate penalty. Now, again, I think Jesus is specifically referring here to false teachers, but we should address leaders who commit other sins against Christians. Spiritual abuse has become more prevalent in recent years, or at least our awareness of it has, spiritual abuse. Mark Driscoll, the former pastor of Mars Hill Church in Seattle, has become the standard example of spiritual abuse in recent years. Christianity Today just concluded a lengthy podcast series called The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill, detailing the abusive behavior of Mark Driscoll. So what exactly is spiritual abuse? One author defined it, Spiritual abuse occurs when someone in a position of spiritual authority misuses that authority, placing himself over God's people to control, coerce, or manipulate them for seemingly godly purposes, which are really his own. So it's using spiritual authority for your own benefit, harming the flock of Christ. One form it takes is that the spiritual abusers like to remind everyone of their power. They have power to elevate someone to a position of prominence. If you receive an anointing from an all-powerful spiritual leader, it's like receiving a blessing from a king. He can elevate you to a position of prominence. Or he can use his power to destroy. Demoting someone in the eyes of the church, even excommunicating them, those who don't wholeheartedly embrace the all-encompassing vision of the spiritual abuser. Mark Driscoll spoke to the leaders of the Acts 29 movement in 2012, a clip that went viral. He says, here's what I've learned. You cast vision for your mission. Remember, he's talking to pastors and church leaders here as a kind of a spiritual guru. You cast vision for your mission. And if people don't sign up, you move on. There are people that are going to die in the wilderness, and there are people that are going to take the hill. That's just how it is. Too many guys waste too much time trying to move stiff-necked, stubborn, obstinate people. I am all about blessed subtraction. There's a pile of dead bodies behind the Mars Hill bus. And by God's grace, it will be a mountain by the time we're done. That's the clip that really went viral. A pile of bodies behind the Mars Hill bus. So in other words, if you don't get on board with Driscoll's specific vision, if you don't get on board the Mars Hill bus, he will run you over. Dozens of leaders at Mars Hill were fired. Many families were excommunicated and ostracized. No one from the church was allowed to talk to them after they left the church. It's like a cult. It's closer to Scientology than Christianity. This obsession with power and authority, sign of spiritual abuse. Another sign is an obsession with secrecy. Driscoll required pastors who were fired from Mars Hill to sign non-disclosure agreements. 
under the threat that they wouldn't receive any severance pay if they did not. A major red flag. What do they have to hide? This secrecy is not uncommon in megachurches. Most megachurches don't disclose their budgets, including their own pastor's salaries. But why? Why not be open and honest? The church's business should be entirely public. Our council will present the budget for 2022 in a few weeks. It's all public. My salary, every penny we spend, how much we have in the bank, all of this is public record. We have nothing to hide. All of our ecclesiastical meetings are open to the public. Nothing happens behind closed doors and smoke-filled rooms. Although sometimes I wish we could get back to smoke-filled rooms, if at least smoking cigars or pipes, but can't get away with that anymore. But they're all open. Anyone can come. Anyone can come to a consistory meeting or a classes meeting or a synod. At times, we do go into executive session. This is restricted to ministers and elders when we discuss sensitive issues like church discipline. But other than that, anyone can attend any meeting. I'm not sure why you'd want to. They're not very exciting. But anyone can attend. The church's business should be conducted in the open. So an obsession with secrecy typically signals spiritual abuse. Our consistory has an obsession with transparency. Every room in this building has a camera, except for the cry room, the bathrooms, and my office. And those rooms have cameras pointed at the door so we know who goes in and who goes out. We even have cameras outside. Of course, we hope and pray that nothing inappropriate ever happens, but if it does, we have it on video. We want everything to be above board, no secrecy. Now, again, I think here Jesus is speaking of those false teachers who lead Christians into apostasy, but he could be referring to young children, the little ones, certainly a viable interpretation. So it is appropriate for us then to address the many accounts in recent years of spiritual leaders who have caused harm to children. This started out as a Roman Catholic problem 20 years ago, the uncovering of abuse by priests. Many Protestants then acted rather smugly, as if this couldn't happen to us. More recently, though, accounts of abuse in Protestant churches have been brought to light. And the cover-up by church leaders is particularly egregious. As if the trauma from abuse is not enough, some church leaders have compounded the problem by not reporting the abu abuse to the proper authorities. And even in Napark churches, this goes on, much to our shame. Just this month, more information has come out about an RPCNA congregation in Indiana. The allegation is that the pastors and the elders intentionally kept quiet reports of abuse involving eight children in the church. The offender was a juvenile who was related to the pastor. Indianapolis Star in July 2021 said the boy was found by a juvenile judge to be delinquent on what would be multiple felony counts of child molesting and was remanded to a residential facility. So it appears now that the Presbytery and the Synod are trying to do the right thing. Ecclesiastical charges have been filed against the pastor and the elders, but the damage is done. Those families will never be the same, and this church will never be the same because of this cover-up of abuse. Of course, we hope and pray that such things never happen in our church, but if we receive a report of abuse, the first thing we do is call the police. There will be no cover-up. So many in the past 20 years have walked away from Christianity because of the church's mishandling of these tragedies, causing harm to the little ones. So we see a radical ethic concerning others. Now we see a radical ethic concerning ourselves, verse 43. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Now you'll notice the ESV does not contain a verse 44 or a verse 46. This is not a misprint. It's because the oldest and best manuscripts of the New Testament do not contain these verses. The King James Version 
for both verse 44 and verse 46 repeats verse 48, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. So it seems as if somewhere along the line, a scribe repeated verse 48, inserting them into verse 44 and verse 46. So that's why they're not included in the ESV. But nothing has changed in the meaning. And notice the parallels of these verses. Each one begins with if. If, it's followed by causes you to sin. And that's followed by cut it off or tear it out. So if blank causes you to sin, get rid of it. Then Jesus gives you the why. Because, the same parallels, it's better to enter life or the kingdom of God crippled, lame, or with one eye. Same formula. The conclusion is then go or be thrown into hell. So that's the formula. If blank causes you to sin, get rid of it because it's better to enter life the kingdom of God maimed than be thrown into hell. Now the word causes you to sin, this is in the present tense. This is temptation of a continual nature. It's habitual sin. It's not a one-time action. So Jesus here gives us a radical ethic. Again, he's using hyperbole. He doesn't want his disciples to mutilate themselves. Although there have been reports in church history of some who took Jesus' words literally. Eusebius, the 4th century church father, recorded that Origen, who was a church father in the 3rd century, reportedly castrated himself. We don't know if he did or not, but those are the reports. But he's not speaking literally. This is hyperbole. His point is to get radical with your sin. He intends to shock his hearers with these words. That's how seriously we should take our sin. If we don't, if we don't take our sin seriously, we will be thrown into hell. Unquenchable fire, he calls it. Verse 43. Verse 48. For their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. You see the footnote in the ESV in Greek. It's Gehenna. In the Old Testament, this is the Valley of Hinnom. This marked the boundary between the lands that were allotted to Judah and to the tribe of Benjamin. The Valley of Hinnom was a site of worship of Canaanite gods, Molech and Bel. And their pagan worship there included sacrificing their children by passing them through fire. Jeremiah 32. They built the high places of Baal in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to offer up their sons and daughters to Molech, though I did not command them, nor did it enter my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. So it's a place associated with fire, with judgment. In the New Testament, it refers to Gehenna metaphorically as a place of everlasting judgment. Its punishment is eternal. The worm does not die. There is no end to this. Its fire is everlasting. It is not quenched. Verse 49, Jesus uses another metaphor. For everyone will be salted with fire. Now, salt, of course, is essential to food. And covenant making and covenant renewing in the ancient world were both connected with meals. That's why we refer to the Lord's Supper as a covenant renewal meal. God renews his covenant with us every Lord's Day, and we have a meal in celebration of that covenant renewal. So covenant making and meals were closely associated with food. Salt is essential to food. Food is connected with covenants. So in Leviticus chapter 2, the prescription is, you shall season all your grain offerings with salt. You shall not let the salt of the covenant with your God be missing from your grain offering. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. So with your offerings that you give to the Lord, you offer salt. With them. Salt is a preservative, keeps things fresh. So it became closely associated with a lasting covenant, a covenant that is preserved, that is kept, that is fresh. Numbers 18 All the holy contributions that the people of Israel present to the Lord I give to you, and to your sons and daughters with you as a perpetual due. It is a covenant of salt forever before the Lord for you and for your offspring with you. Also, 2 Chronicles 13. Ought you not to know that the Lord God of Israel gave the kingship over Israel forever 
to David and his sons by a covenant of salt. So Jesus picks up this imagery, this imagery that's closely related to the Old Testament sacrificial system, the imagery of salt as part of this forever covenant. And he says, everyone will be salted with fire. Now, instead of the Mosaic sacrifice being salted and offered to God in the fire, now we are, everyone, God's people are seasoned with salt, offered as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is our spiritual worship. So we're seasoned with salt, also a symbol of purification. We offer pure sacrifices to God by the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 50, salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Again, a symbol of the covenant. And so he offers a warning not to lose your saltiness. Don't violate your covenant with God. If you do, how will you make it salty again? You can't regain the flavor. It's a warning against apostasy. So don't follow the false teachers from verse 42, leading the little ones astray. Don't be led away from the faith into apostasy. Don't lose your saltiness by abandoning the covenant of grace and demonstrate that you were only a member of the covenant externally and not internally. And he concludes by saying, if we have salt in ourselves, we can be at peace with one another. If we have salt in ourselves, we have peace with God. We're made pure in Christ. And if we have peace with God, we can have peace with one another. And so we need not fear that we'll lose our saltiness because Christ himself preserves us. He displayed the most radical kingdom ethic by living a life free from sin. And contrary to the teaching of Saul Alinsky, God's law is the universal standard of right and wrong. And Jesus perfectly fulfilled that law in our place. He died as a payment for the countless times that our hands and feet and eyes have caused us to sin. And he rose victorious, conquering the power of death. He entered into the age to come. Even though we continue in sin, we don't need to mutilate ourselves because our sin is forgiven and we possess the righteousness of Christ. Nothing can change our status as justified before God because Christ himself preserves us. John 10, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. I and the father are one. Notice one more thing. Verse 43, he says, enter life. Verse 45, enter life. This is parallel to verse 47. Enter the kingdom of God. For the disciples to enter life is to enter the kingdom of God. This can't refer to physical life, as in their physical birth. It refers to eternal life. To enter the kingdom of God is to enter into eternal life. And the question is, when does this take place? When do we take possession of eternal life? When do we enter into God's kingdom? Is this only a future reality? Remember what we saw way back in chapter 1. The king and the kingdom are here. He says the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And so we already have entered into his kingdom. Philippians chapter 3. Our citizenship is in heaven, Paul says. We're in the kingdom now. Already, we have entered into eternal life. Again, John 10, he says, I give them eternal life. Not I will give them. We possess it now. Eternal life. They will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. We have entered into eternal life in Christ because we are united to him. Ephesians 2. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, 
even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The kingdom has arrived. And so we must adopt Christ's kingdom ethic. But even when we don't fulfill his kingdom ethic perfectly and we fall into sin, remember that we are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. We are already citizens of his kingdom. We already possess eternal life. And so we wait. We wait on the edge of our seat for the return of our king when his kingdom will be consummated and we will be free from the presence of sin forevermore.